chapter 24, and I want to just address a small thing in 24 and then deal with it a little further in uh, chapter 19. Isn't it interesting how Luke is just full of Jesus going to people's homes and eating at their tables? Just full of it. And I'm, I'm not even mentioning all that are here, but uh, starting in uh, verse, um, let's just start at verse 30. <clears throat> and it came to pass, as he sat eating with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished out of their sight. I want to just address something that we sort of mentioned in the last class, but um, not really, I don't think, with clarity. And that is that uh, most of the examples that we've used this whole course have been situations where someone gives you a certain amount of leeway and you respond to that. <clears throat> but I want to give a couple of situations here where Jesus discerned or perceived where the person or people were at, and he responded according to the degree that he perceived they gave him. Now, the reason why I would normally not even mention that is because I don't know that we know the difference between discernment and thinking more highly of ourselves than we are. So that it is possible for someone to go, oh, they, they think I'm next to God, man. I, they think I'm really special, so I'm going to act like it, you know. And um, <clears throat> it's better to err on the side of humility <laughs> than it is to just assume that people are, because, you know, and if, let's just put it this way, if you do, get it wrong, and then they say, take the lower seat, then you know how to be abased. And you know how to take that seat without going through turmoil and all this stuff of, oh my God, and you know, I wish I, you know, <clears throat> all that kind of stuff. So in this case, Jesus was able to tell from that, and one of the, one of the places that you can see that is, uh, well, verse 28, and they drew near into the village to which they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. Okay, honestly, this is sort of a trick to find out where they're at. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying Jesus tricked anybody. Whatever. I'm just saying this is a tool where he said, okay, well, I'm leaving you guys, you know, check you later. And they went, no. You see, they're responding to him in a larger way than just, uh, okay, dude, it's nice hanging out. They're sensing something. And in fact, it, it, say, it goes on to say, uh, verse 29, but they constrained him saying, abide with us. Um, <clears throat> so clearly they, they, they're honoring him and Jesus is perceiving the depth of that honor. Now, I have to say, because when I read this, I thought, now, you know, did they give him the kind of honor where he could literally open himself to them and they recognize him and they know him in fullness? Or, you know, you know what I'm saying, in, in a way larger way? Well, apparently, to some degree, they did because their immediate response to that was, and they said one to another, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked with us along the way and he opened to us the scriptures. And those are all signs and clues that there is a, um, an official glory. And, and let me say this. You can give somebody official glory with whom in your heart you are simply honoring the glory of nature in that person. Do I need to say it again? You can actually, from your heart, give someone official glory when 
you are doing that from your heart based on the glory of nature that you see at work in them. You see a spirit. You see, a, you see Christ. You see a selflessness. You see, uh, and you are honoring officially that. And I think of the, what scripture comes to mind, honor to whom honor is due. Okay, now, let's consider real honor. Is real honor the fact that, uh, uh, gosh, I don't know, I wish I could think of some real great examples of this. Uh, let me just say this before I try to attempt that. Many times we honor things that, that is simply honoring an act and not honoring the fact that they're honorable. The person isn't honorable. They did something that benefited you. So you honored them officially with official glory. No, no, that's, that's, that's something honorable within them. That's, you know. <clears throat> but uh, that's why I couldn't think of the perfect example to give of someone who just did something, uh, you know, I, you know there are a million examples of this, but 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 it is. But what we tend to do is not necessarily honor someone before because of their nature, because of their character, because of Christ within them. Um, uh, I, for example, I said recently of Brother Lumen that he doesn't honor, like if you preached a really good sermon. He may not say anything to you, not because it wasn't good or the Lord, but maybe he perceives that you had little to do with that other than God revealed his son in you and the spirit was on you and delivered it. And he's perceiving very little of you is in there. Therefore, very little honor goes to you. Does that make sense? And therefore, he's not quick to, whereas we would more quickly honor their flesh, maybe. I mean, I'm just trying to break through here and get, let you to see something here that, that um, um, the, true, the truest honor is honor of nature. And if someone else perceives in you the glory of nature, the life of Christ, the selflessness of that, they may set about to do something that would give you official glory. Do you see what I'm saying? But it's the highest glory when you know they're honoring Christ and his selflessness, and therefore you're not getting all caught up in the thing. You know, what's that, what's that old story about the guy that, won the award for being the most humble, but they had to take it away because he accepted it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes. Very good example, <clears throat> because maybe uh, th that's that's right down the line of what I how I wanted to say it. A person perceives the eloquence of a of a person uh, and their delivery, and gives official glory to that. When in reality, that may be something they were birthed with, of which they have no reason to be honored because it's just how they were born uh, whereas someone else delivers preaches Christ and the person is not seen but the Lord that was delivered was powerful and beautiful and all you talk about is Jesus but you know isn't that 
really a high honor for that person. I mean, I, I perceived, I remember when I perceived Galatians 2.20 once when, when uh, Paul said, not I, but Christ. And if someone said, I see Christ in you, and they truly do, is there any higher thing that could be said of you? <laughs> you know, oh, you have, you know, beautiful eyebrows. Well, oh, okay. Um, pardon? <clears throat> However that fits in. I don't know all things, but that could be the key to everything we're saying here. <laughs> On the other hand, it may not be. <clears throat> Okay, uh, <laughs> so basically what I'm saying at this point is <clears throat> that uh, I believe with maturity there is a place, and I say with maturity because you can't do this right off when you're just learning the difference between a seeking official glory and the glory of nature and that sort of thing, uh, where you think you start discerning everybody's honoring you when they're not or something like that. I think there has to be a time to walk in whatever degree they give you, that's what you'll respond to and you won't take any more and say I deserve more and I know more than you and my God, why aren't you letting me talk here <laughs> or something like that. Um, but that with time, I believe there is a place of discernment uh, whereby you perceive where they're at. And I'm going to use another example of this, but I'm setting that up through these scriptures right here. Yes, did you have your hand up? Uh, up? So is that ringer. <laughs> oh, let's see. I mean, it really is getting to the point where we may need to start putting up a sign, turn cell phones off here. Yes. It, that this whole kenosis thing has been about um, you know you, you know making yourself of no reputation of not taking that uh, uh, that not not putting yourself forth based on any other glory than the glory of nature regardless of what people do you, you see what I'm saying? And that's the real basis of what we've been going on here. So, you know, as long as that's kept in the forefront, you know, anything else can be weighed in light of that. Yes? I think it just really kind of light as how messed up we are in our thinking process. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like, you know, we'll get this word, you know, we'll get something more that we'll share. And then if we don't get this response that we think we should get, that people should have, then we get offended, <laughs> you know. And but the twist is, you know, we're offended because you know people are ignoring the Lord's word. But no, we're mad because they didn't take us seriously, you know. You know, so many people resist the preaching of the cross, and yet without the cross, 
we are doomed. Doomed, I say. <laughs> so that's just, you know, we know why the cross must be preached. I believe most of us here know that it, we must embrace the cross. <clears throat> you know, why? Because we desperately need the Lord in light of our selfish, ugly selves. Maybe everyone else is beautiful. We are the ugly zoo. <laughs> All right, let's go to uh, Luke 19, and we'll see uh, another example of this, and then we'll close out with Jesus at Bethany, which is a good place to close, isn't it, at, at that table? <clears throat> okay, uh, Luke 19, and beginning with verse 1, this is the story of Zacchaeus. Now, you may remember Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. <laughs> I was hoping I'd get a response there. Thank you, brother. <clears throat> and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was the chief among the tax collectors. And he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus. Now, right there is a point of discernment. This guy is seeking to see Jesus. <coughs> who he was, and could not because of the crowd, for why? He was a wee little man, yes. <clears throat> he was little of stature, <clears throat> and, and he ran ahead, okay, and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And before we get to the rest of the story, Let's consider the picture of what this is painting for us here. This picture is painting for us a, um, uh, well, I'm going to use the vernacular of the present day, but a popular person is coming to town. A popular person is passing through town, whether it be of this or that or whatever. It is a person that would move the crowds to line the streets. Okay? Now, Jesus many times would respond to that kind of glory if it was truly given. He would be the son of David because the story just before this, if I'm not mistaken, are, is blind Bartimaeus. And he responded to son of David because he was the son of David and so he met him on that basis. You see what I'm saying? So people, so he, he is willing to respond on um, he's the son of God. He knows everything. He can, you know, he'll be all of that if you'll let him. That's, that's my point. But his nature will never, it'll never go to his head because of his nature. Because he lives not by official glory or based on, and his identity is not founded on official glory. Or lack thereof. Therefore, negative and bitter and ugly. It's not that, or we're not that either. <clears throat> God willing. So, so here you got these streets lined with people, and Zacchaeus is a little guy, and he can't see over the crowd. So, I mean, this is looking like some sort of politician or somebody famous coming through the town, and he wants to see him. And he wants to see, I like the way it worded, though, see who he is. You know, I want to see who he is. <clears throat> uh, well, let me read on before I make that statement. Um, and he, for he passed that way in verse 5, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must abide in thy house. And he made haste, and he came down and received him joyfully. Isn't that amazing? Jesus invited himself into this guy's house. There were people who wouldn't even invite Jesus into their home. It appears from what I've seen that everybody that did in the Bible, that it says everybody that did invite Jesus into their home, he went in there. But this was the only case I could find where Jesus invited himself into their home. 
So, of course, my mind begins to go, now, why is this? Is this breaking the pattern? Is something going wrong here? Are we supposed to just go around and go, oh, invite me in. I'm somebody big, you know? Because if it is, I'll just go out there and do it. Not really. I'm, I'm just saying. <clears throat> but, I mean, you know, that's, you know, we can come off with all sorts of things if we don't have a good, clear-cut pattern. Um, <clears throat> and so... Uh, so there are certain conclusions that I started coming to. So let's finish reading the story. <clears throat> and he made haste, in verse 6, and he made haste, came down and received him joyfully. There's another, another clue, another uh, point to help us to discern what level of uh, uh, honor or uh, glory, official glory, whatever degree you can operate on into their lives. Um, in verse 7, And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. So, so uh, this, for me, was beginning to paint a picture, and I felt like I got the picture from there on down that Zacchaeus was ready in his heart to receive Jesus on a salvation basis. But, but not only Zacchaeus, but who else? His whole house. His whole house. Therefore, Jesus invites himself, believing, feeling that he knows that that much entrance will be given by this man. So let's read on to make sure that we're right. <clears throat> um, the last word in verse 7 is, last two words, a sinner. Verse 8, And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. So here he is, as it were, making right, admitting there were wrongs, saying to Jesus, not, you know, explain the universe or what's the basis of the Pharisaical religion or, or any of that stuff. He's bringing up to Jesus before we, we hear anything from Jesus other than, today I'm coming to your house, okay? He's like confronted with this one that must have been a savior and must have thrown a contrast to his life. But there's more. <clears throat> um, uh, I restore fourfold. And then verse 9, And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation. This day is salvation come to this house. Not just to you, Zacchaeus. This house for as much as he also is the son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So clearly from the context, and this is, this is how I drew all of my conclusions, was I would go through the context and see uh, a lot of the clue for me at first was how did Jesus respond? Because he, I, we know he would only take whatever prerogative was given to him and when I would see the specific area he would respond either as 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 Lord in the sense of disciples and he's their teacher then he would respond as teacher and rebuker of their life because he was their rabbi he was their teacher if it was a Pharisee who was off and they called him in authority by calling him master, then he would deal with them on that issue only. And if it was, as in the case of Zacchaeus and who was it last class that we, we pardon? Um, I'm trying to remember here. Let's see. Uh, Levi. Yeah, Levi. In the, in the initial calling of Levi, the context was salvation. All the way around. Front, back, and middle. 
And so I would watch Jesus' response, and then in some cases, after I got into this, because there were so many examples of him getting into people's homes and responding, after a while, uh, I would predict or try to, you know what I mean, try to predict what is the real issue here, and many times I'd get it right because of the principle that he always makes himself of no reputation. Uh, that that's, goes without saying, but if someone gives him a certain degree of official glory, he will move in the, deg the degree to which he is given. So I was able at the end to start predicting where this was going. All right, so let me make sure I've read all my notes here. <clears throat> uh, in Jericho, Zacchaeus honored him in an official capacity as Savior. He honored, the honor was seen by climbing up just to get a glimpse of him. Jesus was being honored, so he invited himself to Zacchaeus' house. Jesus was uninvited to other homes, but invites himself to this house. But Zacchaeus was ready to welcome Jesus. Another case of being able to perceive, even though they may not say it, to perceive the degree, and, and again, not beyond the degree. Because, and I'll be honest with you, I mean, I have stepped through something that I thought was there and immediately found that it wasn't, and you just step right back out. You know, there's no need arguing with it or going, my God, don't you, you know. <laughs> you know. I mean, it's just true. I mean, we... Whether we would ever do that, our minds would. It would say, and now you're backing me off instead of here. I should be way up there. But that's not Christ. And it is not uh, a man, mankind. When I say man, a man in kenosis. It's not a man, it's not someone in kenosis. But we are in kenosis because kenosis is the way of approach. It is the way Jesus approaches all things. And if not, he'd have just busted everything wide open and said, I'm it, and all of you bow down now. But he never did that. He never did that. And to whatever degree, it's open to whosoever will. But guess what? Whosoever will is not the only thing. Whosoever will to whatever degree. You know, does that lessen him as the son of God? No. Does it make him smaller? Maybe, maybe in the eyes of some people because he wouldn't demand his right, demand his place. Maybe, maybe, maybe some people think, well, you know, because this person pushes themselves forward and this one doesn't, this person is the one to be honored because they're greater. No. Jesus says, he that will be greatest shall be Servant of all. Yes. Before I came to the U.S., I was into world religions, and I traveled around the world with different people from different religions. And the one thing that convinced my heart that Jesus was God was that he was the only God that was selfless. And he had that spirit of gnosis. He was the only God that had that nature. And that was the one thing that convinced me that he was God and everything else was an imposter. And then the Holy Spirit came in, but that follows through to everything. He wouldn't be God if he acted the way other dictators and other leaders. That would disqualify him from being the one true God because only God has this nature. And however strong or powerful or deep or ascended or whatever, they all were self-absorbed, exalting beings who wanted you to worship them, and who's the only one who poured out for everyone else. And I knew that that had to be God. Mm -hmm. And it has to follow through to everything he does. Everything he does. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, way, the way I was thinking of, there's some people that you feel so comfortable, for lack of a better word, that you can go to their house without any, you know, invitation or anything. The house is open. Good point. And there's others. You call ahead of time and say, is this okay if right. I come over? Um, because there's just, you know that like, they need a preparation there. The other one doesn't care how their house looks. 
Our uh, heart is your welcome. My home is your home. Mi casa su casa. Right. That, that thing. And that's what I see with the kids, the Levi, and others that he brought to the house, like Mary and Lazarus. And he pretty much invited himself in because he had that freedom. Whereas the others, they were not opening the door. Maybe they cracked it open a little bit. So he had to wait for the invitation. Right. And the others, the heart was already inviting them in. Yes. And, that's, and that's the key. Mm -hmm. Can we discern the degree of that, or are we going to be um, uh, big-headed about it? When I was, I was joking with some of the Mexican brothers down there, preachers, they were standing in a little circle there, kind of a junta, talking as I was walking up, and we were beginning, about to begin service. And, and there is a phrase that is very impressive down there to them, if you call them that. It is, uh, it is barones de Dios, barones de Dios. And barones comes from the word baron, barons of God, you know. And so I... I so I walked up, and they're familiar with the term, and you don't hear it that often, but, you know. So I walked up to them, and as I was walking up, I said, Barones de Dios. And they all went, oh, yeah. You know, they, were, they were joking, but I'm just, they were, oh, oh, yes, yes, you know, and everything. And I said, I said, no, escucha me. No, you didn't hear me. Uh, and they said, what? And I said, Balones de Dios. And I did this. <laughs> And it comes from balloon, meaning swollen. And they have this little thing. If you do this, it means you have a big head. This is the, and they all knew that. So I said, balon, that's there. And they went, oh, he got us, you know. <clears throat> I can joke around in Spanish, too. Okay, we need to move on, try to finish this last one. Chapter 10, Luke chapter 10 and verse 38. This is probably the most commonly known, especially among our people, Martha and Mary. <clears throat> um, and most of you here know this, though maybe some listening to this may not, but we are all very aware that Jesus' relationship with this family was as a family member, as a very close friend. Okay? You with me? Because in, in light of this sharing that we've been talking about in kenosis, Jesus will respond according to what's given him even in this situation, which is totally different than what everyone else had. <clears throat> um, verse 38, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house, and she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But... Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Um, the next part seems to be that he's no longer in the house, and I believe that's probably correct. So, so that is the story, that is the invitation, that is the table, that is the house to which he's been brought into. <clears throat> and at Bethany, he's relating as a friend, he's relating as one loved by this family. So let me just read my little notes here. Uh, now, oh, now Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. That's a verse also in the Bible. Now Jesus loved them. He's come into that home on what capacity? As a friend, as a loved one, all right? <clears throat> and so uh, this is not a relationship of official nature, such as shepherd or savior. Jesus fits in in a manner that they allow. He does not intrude. He does not intrude. Mary listens to his word. Martha serves. Jesus does nothing to change the issue, for he is an invited guest. 
the next words that I would have written down begin with what word? But, but when one of the family asks him to correct a situation as some sort of official, he speaks into the situation. And I'll go on and further from that in just a minute. But it is just like what he did in the Pharisees' home. He, he entered as a guest. He fit in to whatever the situation was. He wasn't trying to take control of it or, or guide it or get it somewhere or do something like that. He was simply there in the manner of a guest as they had invited him to eat and enjoy the meal. And that's where, and almost every one of them says, and he sat down and he began to eat, what was it, eat at meat or take meat or eat, you know, with them. And, uh, and in this situation also, he's not intruding. He's not noticing what's wrong, what's out of order here, what's this and that. Well, that would relieve a bunch of you right there, <laughs> you know, of, of looking at all the issues that, you know, and I'm going to say it like this, and I don't mean any harm in it, uh, of uh, looking at all the issues which are none of your business, you know. You're not there on that level. And if they didn't open the door any more, then Jesus would have sat there and eaten the meal and enjoyed their company and gone from that place. All right, but when one of the family asks him to correct the situation and puts him on an official level, then and only then does he speak. Even then, he does not deal with how their family should function as a family, but only how they should be spiritually. In other words, he didn't say, Mary uh, should be helping you. This is wrong. He didn't say, Mary shouldn't be helping you. Do you see how those are issues of, of the family? He spoke on a spiritual level. He didn't say, um, um, you know, this is a symptom of problems in this family. <laughs> and I need to address not just this, but the color you painted your house <clears throat> and the way that you, you know, this and that, <clears throat> getting into, you know what I mean, getting into issues that they were not opening the door to. So Jesus does speak when invited on the specific thing and he addresses it though he will not intrude into the family. He addresses it on a spiritual level and he says, Martha, you are troubled about many things. That's your being. That's your spiritual state. Period. You could have walked off with that. <laughs> Right? You brought it up. Read them and weep. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but Mary has chosen the important thing. Okay. That's the real issue. Okay. Um, should the sister get up and help? When I'm doing things around the house or cleaning up after dinner, when I'm the one that's cooked dinner or whatever, and I find myself becoming troubled mm -hmm. that I'm doing something, more and more I find that the Lord helps me and he deals with me. Right. Because if I'm troubled that I'm serving my family, I'm probably the one with the issue. But, you know, and so here it's like Martha could have been serving her family right. in the right spirit. Right. and not had an issue with it, and it wouldn't have needed even to be corrected. But the issue wasn't that she was serving and, Martha, and Mary was sitting. No, the issue exactly was right. 
that she was careful and troubled or anxious and troubled. And that's what Jesus addressed. And, and I think that's so important because we always assume mm -hmm. that um, she should have been down on the floor listening or whatever. But that wasn't the real issue with her. Not with her. Her deal is she's just wrapped up in everything. And uh, there is a way to serve, listen to carefully, there is a way to serve when no one else will help you out and still do it in the Lord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, there is. And Jesus might have said, Martha, you know, if she had never brought something, Martha, you know, you're doing good, you know. <laughs> and Mary, you're doing good. And then we'd all been confused. <laughs> you know, well, you know, and I've heard, I've <laughs> and I've heard people say, "Well, I'm just a server, so I'm I'm like Martha, and I always feel so bad because I don't, you know, feel like getting down there and da 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 da. I feel like I want to serve everybody. What if that was Jesus? And what if they're actually not cumbered about anything that they're talking about? Well, then that's fine. Jesus was not making the order of the home the issue." Can you see how that, that's, that's how we make it the issue and that's how we perceive what's being said here. He's not making the order of the home the issue. He is making their hearts the issue. And he speaks on that level and you might even say that he still kept it on the level of being a friend. <laughs> but they ask him to speak so it's more than that. But you see what I'm saying? Yes. Mary, who also said at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So it's, so it's saying that Martha also heard his word and had said at his feet. But like you said, her being was being comforted. So she was someone that did hear his word. She did listen to him. She was someone that, you know, wanted to hear his word. Um, so he was able to like said, speak right back to her heart. And but her problem was that she was comforted. A lot of people think, oh, well, should I start, stop serving and start sitting in the feet? But this is saying clearly that Martha, I'm <coughs> reading right, Martha and <coughs> received his word and sat at his feet, but Martha had an inner turmoil when she got up and started serving. You know? I think you'll find later in John, Jesus is at this same house and it says, um, let's see, I, I, can't, I won't be able to quote it perfectly, but Mary sat at Jesus' feet, Martha served. And Lazarus sat at the table with Jesus. And there's no condemnation in Is the Lord hypocritical? Is he just... Listen to the word. You know, that time, after having corrected her before, you think you're going to get this. She did get it. That's exactly right. She got. She did get it, um, and I. Be, I personally believe, and I'm not refuting anything you said, but I personally believe that she began to hear his word. She did chose choose the more important part uh, after that, and she got the point because if the point was to get at his feet, I think she would have done it. Um, That's the point, that she was getting his word, but she was serving and she was doing what she felt was right. And she wasn't, and one big difference in that scripture is she's not over there talking to Jesus about somebody else being messed up. <laughs> I think that's sort of a, a, a big point there, too. Did you have your hand up or did I? Oh, no, I was thinking uh, something that Jennifer was saying, how the Lord, you know, use the situation to show you. And, and I know, I remember one time that Nathaniel was just, I mean, he pushed my buttons so that, that I reacted. And after blasting him or whatever, I can't remember what I did, I went to my, and I just started crying. And he walked in on me, 
And he says, why are you crying? I said, because I didn't do it. He says, I'm the one that did wrong. I didn't know. I said, yes, but no. I said, I did not do the Lord. You know, I did not give the Lord. I gave me, you know, basically. And the Lord showed me how much it was me. And because he came at me. <laughs> right. And, and the Lord used that. Like he, and Mary, he showed me my spiritual. Yes, he was wrong, but that wasn't what the Lord wanted to show me. He, was, mm -hmm. he wanted to show me where my heart was. Right. And that I was troubled and anxious and worried and was not allowing you know, to sit. I was not sitting at his feet as I was correcting him. Right. So, anyway, in conclusion on that and the rest is just this, this thing of, of uh, glory of nature and to be content with what people give you and to not think that, you know, not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Um, um, and if no one acknowledges you, but you live by... The glory of nature the father will acknowledge you because he sees his son and that really is the only thing that's going to count in the long run any certificate or thing somebody gives you will you know soon pass away turn yellow and then fall apart so um uh, i'll just close with this and that is that i saw that pattern in philippians when it was talking about kenosis and Jesus uh, said, um, uh, well, Paul said, let this mind be in you. Let this kenosis mind be in you. And that mind was that he didn't think it a thing to be grasped after, to be equal with God on the level of glory and honor and prestige and power and all of that. He didn't think it a thing to be grasped after because he was a, a, a man in kenosis, uh, but he made him, he emptied himself of all outward things that would be done that could gain official glory that were, did not just come from nature. And, you know, stripped himself down and made himself. God didn't, the devil didn't, he made himself of no reputation so that if anyone perceived him, it would be by revelation, Jesus said when Peter spoke up, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And, uh, and, and then you see that's in the second chapter of Philippians. And then immediately you see in the third chapter what applied to Jesus, Paul immediately applies to him own self and says what things were gained to me, the things of being, because he, he states what things, he states just before that what those things were, and that was they were all things of reputation. They were all things of glory, uh, born of the, you know, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee, uh, concerning righteousness of Pharisee, uh, uh, of the stock of Benjamin, uh, all of these things that in Israel were things of great honor and official, they, they gained you official glory in the eyes of people. What things were um, brought glory apart from the nature of Christ, I count has done. And count it all loss and make myself a man in kenosis. And I, you know, you could say it like this, Paul speaking, and I, the man who asked you to let this mind be in you, I'm doing it. I believe in it. I'm ordering my life after it because I believe it is Christ in us to do that. I believe this is what we're called to. And then ends, ends the thing with, you know, now you. you know, 
ends the letter with, now you do this. You come into this. And let's keep it passed down and let's keep this in the forefront. Well, uh, and again, how much time we got? Just a few minutes, right? Okay. You know, when I came to the Lord and visited a church, everything, and I mean this, everything that I heard from the pulpit was, now that you're born again, you are great. You are a child of the king. You are powerful. You have all the authority that he has. You're something. You, you're, you know, and it all loaded you with, you know, ammunition to bolster your ego and to sort of demand from those around you, your family that was unsaved or whatever, that they honor you because now you have reached the highest place that a human being can on the earth. I mean, is anybody, does anybody identify with that? You know, and so you're like, dude, I'm the righteousness of God. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm quoting me. <laughs> you know, I, again, you know I left off the last part. In union with Christ, I mean, you know, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. And I, you know, and I mean, it, it is just the opposite. It is gaining every ounce of, of official glory, and it is gaining every ounce. It is, it is um, uh, thinking, what is it? It is thinking that it is robbery if someone doesn't honor you the way you should be honored. Is thinking that it is robbery. That's Jesus thought it not robbery. And Paul didn't, but we do because we've missed the mark. And in modern day terms, we've missed the boat. And more importantly, we've missed Jesus. We've missed Jesus. And it's become about us instead of about him. And it's become about people giving us glory and honor, and to whatever degree we get that, then we think that's what glorifies Jesus. The greater my honor, the greater glory he gets. That's not right. It's not right. His honor is not measured by me. His honor is measured by himself, by his nature, by his selflessness. And that's the way God measures him, when he said after he did all that, wherefore God hath highly exalted him. Well, that is official glory, isn't it? And giving him a name above every name, isn't it? It is. But who was it sat down on that throne? A lamb. Lamb upon the throne. All right, so let's pray. Father, I thank you for this class and my part in it. I pray that the rest of the sessions will be full of life, full of the word of, of life. I ask you to loose the spirit of truth so that we are able to receive <coughs> and, and perceive nothing short of <coughs> your life and your nature. And Father, I pray that uh, what has been shared up to this point will be spirit and life the words will be spirit in life and not just another class and another talking time period. Father, I thank you for all the comments that people have made. I've heard, I've truly heard uh, comments from the heart and from eyes that do perceive that the, that the, one who is seated at your right hand is a man in kenosis and always will be. He's a lamb. So, Father, we look to you for the results of all of this in our own lives and in history down here. We just trust you. We just look to you. We just cleave to you. Make it real into, in us more and more. Make it the path of the righteous where the sun gives.
gets so high that there are no more shadows and all, all is seen only in light of the sun. May that be the path of the righteous. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, we're dismissed.